just want to say thank you to uh, all of you guys for coming to see the film. I want to say thanks to Array. I uh, want to say thank you to Court 13, New Orleans Film Society, uh, Ben, Wendell, Kaye, Dominique, Braylon, Mose, Ojo, my mother, my sister, my whole family, everyone who helped make this film possible. So I uh, hope you enjoy the film and I'll talk to you right after. How you guys doing? Good. Hello, everyone. Um, how are you doing? I am um, Ethan Arisi. I play the young Yusuf Salam um, in Ava DuVernay's When They See Us. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here to moderate this conversation with these two wonderful men. Um, okay, I think I'm just gonna have to take out my phone, but uh, we can just get right into it. First question for Philip. What was the inspiration behind making Burning Cane? Uh, the inspiration for Burning Cane came from uh, my childhood in the Baptist Church, uh, sort of reckoning with a lot of the questions, hypocrisies, and fallacies uh, that I struggled with for years in growing up in the church. Uh, and wanting to sort of create uh, a portrait of that community, of a world that I knew, um, that I felt like I could give an honest, sort of authentic insight into, and also make a, a critique of, you know, uh, because Bernie Kane is a cautionary tale about, you know, among other things, the dangers of enacting and believing in a fundamentalist interpretation of religion, uh, and in all the sort of pitfalls and antiquated values that come with that. So. That was really the sort of substantive inspiration in Burning King. <laughs> How old are you again? Uh, I'm 19. Also 19. Um. <laughs> All right. Um, next question. <laughs> so what I find um, most impressive about all of this is that, like you said, you're 19 and you ended up wearing multiple hats for this film. Um, you're an executive producer, writer, director, and cinematographer. So what challenges um, did that present and what advantages did that present as well? Um, I guess the, the one challenge that I would say was, 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 was necessarily, didn't necessarily feel like a challenge, just more, I don't know, it's hard to describe. I would say directing and shooting was probably the biggest thing where I could say, all right, I can recognize the difference now, having just had my first experience just directing. Because I feel like when you're making independent cinema with such few resources, everyone's always wearing multiple hats. Whether or not it's your director is also, you know, uh, your DP or your uh, producer is also your boom op. In the case of Burning Cane, that was definitely the case. Um, and it was just, just, I think, more rooted in the fact that, you know, there were so many roles and so many hats that you know everyone had to wear just because of that the sort of limited resources that we had. Uh, but it was also something that I enjoyed, you know, because it was definitely, like I said, um, really the best summer of my life. It was the most invigorating experience. I also had in incredible actors that I think were honestly patient with me, considering that there was a, a mind split that had to be there. Thinking about trying to have those, you know, sort of mutual conversations with your actors trying to be present and aware for them as much as you possibly can, while also considering shot selection, consider, considering lighting, considering, you know, all the things that come with that. Uh, but I love doing everything, you know? I think the biggest question, I love editing too, and I think I found my editing style with this project. Uh, I think I realized that so much about how I like to see a lot of sound sort of bleed in and out of the next scene. I hear a lot of pre-lap and post-lap, I found with this. Um, but I think moving forward, I think the biggest question is like, that's what I like doing to sort of satisfy me feeling a certain, in truth, a certain ownership over it, but that's not always in the best interest of the project. And so I think that's something that as I look forward and move forward into my next project, um, or well in the case of Bernie Kane, I was in the best interest. You know what I mean? That's what I had to do. And I'm happy that I did that. Uh, and moving forward in terms of projects, I think the question of whether or not I'm going to continue to shoot my stuff 
continue to slowly edit. Though I'd like to do those things all the time, you know, do as many things as possible, I think it is important to really sort of verify and critically consider whether or not the project wouldn't be serviced by then bringing in an amazing DP. Right. Someone who could, because you're still the director, you're still making the shot list, you're still the writer, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, I don't know the answers to that stuff, you know, because I've only really known it in truth and earnest from that other side of having to do kind of everything and fill those creative roles. Uh, but it's interesting to consider, nonetheless. All right, All right. Um, now a question for Dominique. Um, how did you and Philip get connected? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, uh, Philip and I were, uh, we were part of an acting class in New Orleans um, some years ago, prior to Bernie King. Um, and so that's how we first uh, became acquainted. Um, and um, I got the call from our acting coach, um, former acting coach, um, about the film. You know, she called and, um, Dominique, do you remember Philip Humans? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I do remember uh, Philip. Well, Philip has written an amazing script. <laughs> That's how she talks. <laughs> and you are the only actor in New Orleans I would even consider suggesting to go audition. <laughs> so um, she's very well respected, and you know, she said it. So I was <clears> like, <throat> all right, no questions asked. I will go and audition. Um, unbeknownst to me was, you know, just how amazing the script was. That's first and foremost. Right. Um, uh, getting to the audition and uh, reading for the role, um, I don't know, there was just, there was just an instant connection um, with me and the character, um, and even more so an instant connection with me and Philip. Um, it was just, it was just really natural and organic. Um, he was very, very well poised. Um, he was very, very uh, deliberate and intentional about what he wanted from the characters, like our conversations, even in the auditions. Uh, in the in the audition was was very um, was very thorough, and he gave me a lot of good kind of like direction to go with the with the audition. So that's kind of like the story of uh, how we connected and you know kind of got to where I was cast as Daniel. Right. So you mentioned the script, um, and I was curious about this. Did you? receive the full script and then go in for the audition or vice versa? And then when you read, when you had, when you did read the full script, what were your thoughts knowing that at the time you were 17 that you had written it, right? Mm -hmm. That a 17 year old kid had written the script, what, what was going through your mind when you had finished? Right, so uh, I didn't receive the script, did I? I think it was sides at first. Yeah, yeah, it was sides, it was sides. Um, but even just, you know, just, I've read many, many sides. You know, I've read, read many, many scripts, but even from the sides, I could tell, like, okay, this is, this is something. Um, uh, and then after uh, receiving the part and receiving the script, that's when I was like really blown away. Um, it, just thinking about the subject matter, just thinking about the depth of the characters, just thinking about all of the exposition that's in between the dialogue, that's kind of like explaining to the reader like what's going on and whatnot. Like it, it was just so it was just so deep, well thought out, um, very very intentional. Um, I was very impressed by the script. Like it really really grabbed me um, almost immediately. And a lot of the things in the script and in the film as well um, was really really reminiscent of um, just my experience at home. Like I'm from Mississippi. And I mean, this is clearly a depiction of, of, of a community in the South. And this community, it almost mirrors the community that I'm from, very rural. Um, if you swap out the cane field, the sugar canes for uh, corn fields, then it would be the exact same thing. So um, there was also an emotional connection with that, um, with the script, and even more so after viewing the film. Um, so yeah. Awesome, cool. Um, this is a question that I have personally, because I was looking for the, the press notes, and um, 
I saw something that had happened while you were filming. I, I believe you were going to film at the slave quarters. Mm. And you said there was a man that said, I, I'm not sure if you were there as well, um, if both of you were there, I'd love for you both to speak on it. But so there was a man that had called the police on you and that you didn't, even though you had permission to film there. Can you, Yeah. just out of my curiosity, I'd just like to know from your perspective what that whole experience was like before I ask real questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that experience was kind of scary, can't lie to you. Um, we were shooting in Lower Valley where we had shot a week before that, but we were shooting a lot of Wendell's exteriors going down the cane field around the Lower Valley Sugar Camp Plantation. And I applied for a permit that day, um, but I never heard back from the sheriff's office. You know that scene in the film when Wendell is driving down the cane fields drunk? I'm inside of the car looking up at him. And then we see him from behind, too, as he's swerving. During that shot, Wendell just pulls his car inside, like, past the cane fields. He pulls his car into, like, a dirt sort of driveway situation and then pulled out and went back down because we were doing another take. But then, like, this dude in, like, almost a monster truck, not really a monster truck, but just a beefed-up truck with a Confederate flag on his driver's side door was, like, driving past us. Then we came back down, parked the car for the next scene. Uh, we're shooting in front of the slave quarters. And then all of a sudden the Lafouche Sheriff's Office was like pretty much all of their patrol cars were like around us. And it was raining. I think we were all pretty scared, honestly. Um, and that overseer, because that plantation still has an overseer, um, was essentially lying, telling them that we were trespassing and that we had, you know, trespassed his property. And the truth, Wendell had just come into the driveway and pulled out. Right. Um, that's Moe's mayor, who was uh, really the only white person in our crew. His father was there. There was some reason, you know, I went up there, my mother went up there to speak to the sheriff's office and to speak to the owner of the property and to the overseer. There's definitely a clear bias in who they wanted to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting that ultimately we got them to agree to let us still shoot forward. Couldn't really get much more coverage. Um, all the other cars that were around us had to leave and go back to base camp. So it was just me with the camera and Mo was holding a, an umbrella over me. The other side of the street was Wendell and Kaia. And uh, we got them to sort of move out of the way. Uh, but then that was the first time we ran into the police, but we ran into them again. The same police with the same overseer and the same owner, again, later on, shooting the uh, burning cane, the opening. Mm. I had, okay, now this was months later. I had, like, this is when we came back for pickups. I had an inkling that this was the same land, but I wasn't positive. But I figured, like, why not still go try and get the shot? So we were driving down this entire sort of like uh, corridor almost where you cut off into the, from the road into a row, or like a dirt row. <clears throat> Once you get to the end, you can see out. There's a field and then you can see the burning cane. We were there and then after shooting that entire sequence, then that sort of monster truck beefed up car comes back again. But then he blocks me off. Like he puts the car like this. So I was trying to like... It was yeah. so weird, yo. It was like, <laughs> like, why do you care so much? Like, we're like, and I had my, my NOCA student ID, and I actually didn't have my driver's license that day. So I was like, you know what? Like, bah, bah, bah. But I also thought, like, if we were going to go down, like, that was, like, kind of, like, a legendary way. <laughs> um, but I was still horrified, you know? Like, that was, right. a, that was a little thought, you know? But luckily that day, actually, my mother came to set, because she was there, I think helping us out with craft and moving props. And so I called her to come from base camp down to where we were shooting, like, we're here, we're here, center my location. She got there, by that point, sheriff's car had started funneling in behind that car. And the thing about it is, uh, my mother was able to divert the fact that I didn't have my license by telling them that, oh, he has a student ID, he has a student ID, he'll show it to you. They're student filmmakers, yeah. they're student filmmakers. Showed him my student ID. Uh, and turns out, the Lufouche Parish Sheriff's Office 
were so tired of that overseer that apparently they were getting calls from him almost by the week, multiple times a week, of him just reporting people, of like consistently doing that. And so what I was so afraid of is once, I, once we started speaking to the Lafouche Parish Sheriff's people, they were, they were, they were, then they opened up about, yo, they knew his name, I don't even remember what his name was, but they were like, oh, we, we hear from him all the time. Yeah. You know, so I just think it's, it's interesting, but they said if we went back, they would press charges, so we have not gone back. Wow. <laughs> My goodness, okay. Ethan, just, yes. sorry, I just want to interrupt. We just want to take the two or three audience questions now. I'm oh, sorry, I've took so long enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 So, um, I guess, uh, so if you could talk to the development of your craft, and then um, I know you spoke to, uh, like, the inspirations, but if you could maybe speak a bit further on, like, um, where you source the, inf the inspiration for some of, like, the archetypes and uh, the motifs within the film, if you could mm. speak to the two. Yeah, I got you. Um, so, uh, in terms of... Uh, the people in the film, really a, a lot of the, I guess, the archetypes of the people were based directly on people that I knew. Uh, Helen really is kind of my grandmother. She was an accountant in the church, still is an accountant in the church. Um, she had a very, very tumultuous relationship with her late husband. Um, but my uncle Kevin and my family, I think it's turned out a little bit better than Daniel and Helen's scenario, you know. Um, Really, the connection with me and the material is, I think, far more thematic than beat for beat, like literal. So I've dealt with a lot of the same pitfalls of toxic masculinity that Daniel deals with, the jealousy, the insecurity, but albeit to a much less extreme extent, especially considering the, the sort of toxicity that's brewing within him and Jeremiah's relationship. I, I understand what it's like to live under the religious convictions that sort of deprive you or really force yourself to deprive yourself of, you know, earthly pleasures or whatever that means, you know. I know what it's like to live under a, a guiding, governing force that I think in a way is, is kind of, can be malicious sometimes, you know. But for me, I felt like with Burning Cane, I was just working out, creating a nuanced picture, trying to create just a further understanding of the people that I grew up around. Because when I was younger, I was far more outspoken and kind of, kind of a jerk about some of my differences. And I think, really, in in creating this sort of like character meditation of these people and having to fully understand and be compassionate and vulnerable to the reasons that they may have for devoting their life to religion and to the church, uh, I think it's sort of given me a, a more nuanced understanding of them. Whereas my convictions haven't changed, you know but I feel like I've just created a more understanding, sort of mature perspective, where I now know that I can really only account for myself, my own beliefs. You know, I can't tell anybody else how to think, but I can still try to probe and ask the question, not be as much of a jerk about it, but still try to deliver it in a way, because I think it's still an important question for us to assess as a community, you know. And I guess the development of your craft, uh, development of the craft. Um, I guess for me, I went to a, a high school for film, um, and I think I got a lot of my technical foundation through that. But I also learned a lot in making Burning Cane. You know, I think for the first time ever, I took it as seriously as I needed to to sort of see a project to fruition. I discovered that I I love handheld and shoulder rig and kinetic active pacing. I also love that pre-lap and post-lap schema in post-production. I think I learned so much about the craft. I'm still learning so much about it today from doing, you know. So, uh, development, I just say, it just came from making it and it's still happening now. So. Two, more, two more questions, quick All questions. Right. Okay, well, I saw you first then. <laughs> Congratulations, I'm from Sri Lanka. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> We are in a residence program of free independent, very such an inspirational film, and I really enjoyed the film. Uh, I, I would like to ask you about, about, about the style, the most of shots, 
low angle mm -hmm. and also looks available lighting. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us why that you wanted to take most of sorts as a low angle mm -hmm. uh, framing? Got you. Um, I know with Helen and Tillman, really there's really the kind of, Tillman has a sort of control and a sort of mayoral status as a pastor within that community. But Helen is actually the character that has a, a decision to make in the film. She's really who the film is, kind of moves through. I think some part of my motivation for using lower angles is difficult to articulate with as much of a, a substantive response outside of uh, aesthetic and, and just the beauty of shooting low and the power that comes with it. And I think that just accentuates those same things of one Helen being the real mover in the family one who's really making any sort of work or doing anything and making anything happen. And then also the sort of mayoral status that Tillman had, especially with the sermon, for the late sermon too, getting low on him as he finally names the devil, I thought was was, uh, was an interesting choice. Um, in terms of like my scheme and in terms of lighting, it was all practically and naturally lit. And I've, I've, I've said about a certain like marrying of circumstances because that is how I like to shoot. I like to shoot with natural and practical lighting with a sort of kinetic active pacing. But I also I also feel like it worked in terms of us like applicably making this film. Because it was it was a marrying in that it was guerrilla and it kept the pace of it active and we didn't have to set up lights for every single setup. And it's also how I like to shoot. So it was just uh it was a twofold sort of beneficial situation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sir, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, what cameras do you use? What's your editing, editing gear? Mm -hmm. And who do you know that made a little boy drink? Who do you know? Mm -hmm. Because that you hit that really hard. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really good because you, you focused and, I, and it moved me like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. So do you know anyone that's young that was forced to drink? No, I don't know anyone that's young that was forced to drink. I know a lot of my friends that I grew up with, that drinking was normalized from a younger age. But I think it's even more interesting to assess how, because it wasn't a taboo, a lot of them didn't act out in the same way that we did or that other, some of my other friends did. And I think when sometimes when taboos are placed on things, then it makes it more enticing to sort of go at that, you know. But for me, it was just Daniel and Jeremiah were just a direct sort of passage of the normalization of all those things. Now, do I know anybody who was giving their children booze at four, five, six, seven, eight years old? No. You know, has it been passed on? Alcohol has been passed on in my family at a slightly older age? Yes, but not to that extreme context. You know, especially in low country South Carolina, it's not really rare for a 10 year old to have like a beer or sometimes if it's at a cookout or something like that, you know, and it does sort of veer off into a different sort of lane. For me, I've just struggled with alcoholism just in trying to, you know, pacify some dark thoughts early on in high school and also later in high school before I made Burning Cane. So I think a lot of that came from me sort of trying to wrestle with and, and comment a lot of those brewing emotions that I felt myself. But albeit, I think I have to just reiterate to a much less extreme and much less toxic context, you know. What was the other question that you had? Uh, what camera oh, the camera. And, and what editing software? Okay, yeah, so we shot using a combination of the Blackmagic uh, 4K production camera, or the first half of principle, and then the Blackmagic first submitting 4.6K, shooting mostly ProRes, but raw whenever we had the space, mostly for exteriors. And then we edited in Premiere Pro and did color in DaVinci Resolve. Nope. I'm a, I'm a little, okay. <laughs> Can we do one more? One, one this is the last one. Last one, last okay, one. I'll try to make it the best one. And I'll be quick. I'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like the movie. It reminded me of, of Miles and Ben and uh, Julie Dad and Mandy Kondad and uh, Charles Burnett. Anyway, the point is, um, you had the one line which said, which was people nowadays. And we, we don't know what is this nowadays. It can be said at any period, right? Mm -hmm. But it is a what for me. This nowadays can be translated as beyond technology or beyond isolation. People be, being not isolated, although we see these individuals, but they were not isolated, especially through communication. 
like uh, the telephone, the television, uh, the record player. These were mediums to reach to each other. Mm -hmm. And those were the scenes when they were not alone. Yeah. And like nowadays when we are alone with our technology. So with this said, I'd like to know, uh, it seems you're a very good writer if you wrote first the script right and then you made the movie. Why did you decide to uh, turn to these mediums, like to make movies about stories of people who are not on the spotlight, who are marginalized, stories who are not in the mainstream media? Why did you decide to communicate your ideas about these people and their stories? And what made you really make, uh, uh, what did you really inspire you to make movies? Why did you become a filmmaker instead of a writer? Mm. Um, well, I've always, I think I've always had a love for film. I think my artistic identity in terms of me wanting to root my creative intention in black stories in my community uh, definitely was developed uh, and I think sort of cemented in high school when I spent time with New Orleans Black Panthers and was developing Burning Cane, you know. I mean, I always knew, you know, since I was a little kid that this is what I really loved doing, you know, making films. But I'm driven to tell stories about my community and the things that I know and things that I feel like I can honestly speak on. Um, so, yeah, that's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Thank you guys all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.